You may go ahead and find your way to Genesis chapter 50. Our text this morning will be Genesis 50 verses 2 through 14. As you find your way there, as usual, I would like to greet any of our guests this morning. So glad you're worshiping with us. I want to point everybody's attention to this card uh, in our worship folder. We call it our Connect card. If you are new with us this morning, we would love for you to fill out your information so we can get acquainted with you. On the other side, we'd love for everybody to consider uh, letting us know how we can pray for you and your family. Uh, so thank you for your help with that. You can leave it in your seat. As you exit or on your way out, you can drop them in the offering baskets. Uh, let me also mention a few other things. One is not in the bulletin, but let me hold it up for you. Uh, we have our next series notebook. So we are going to be going through the book of Galatians as a church next uh, it's hard to believe we are two more weeks and done with Genesis. It's been wonderful. Uh, I'm looking forward to have finished in that and cannot wait to preach through Galatians. And we provided these notebooks to help you uh, throughout each week prepare for worship. Uh, these are $10, and we want to remind you, as we did this with the Genesis notebooks, that all the proceeds uh, is going to go away from us. We want to bless other people in a gospel way, and this particular time, we're going to try to find a good destination that will help towards uh, Ukrainian relief. So if you would please consider getting one, two, or a dozen of these, 10 bucks a pop. Uh, they're available out on the table. They'll be available next week as well, and uh, probably for a few more weeks. Uh, hopefully, we will have to print more. We would love to do that. You may say, well, I'm not much of a reader. Okay, but we would love to have your $10 anyway to help contribute to Ukrainian relief. We would love to be able to bless some people. Even if it is in a small way, uh, it would be a blessing to others. So please consider getting one of these Galatians notebooks uh, and be in prayer for that series coming up. Uh, 30 sermons in the book of Galatians, I believe. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God shows us and why he wants us to walk through that book together uh, during this time as a church family. Let me also remind you of what I mentioned last week with the gospel class that uh, one of our elders, Alan Vance, is teaching. He's offering it four separate times. It's a, it's a one-session class. He's offering it for the four Sundays in June. So what I would ask, I would beg every one of you to consider signing up. You say, well, I know the gospel. That's one good reason to go and hear the gospel articulated again and have an opportunity to think it through and help equip us to teach the gospel to someone, to evangelize, to worship better. And so I would encourage you, please sign up. It looked like we got off to a pretty good start last week with the signups. Uh, please consider signing up for that. Uh, if you are in college or a young adult, or if you know one, I want to remind you, this Wednesday begins their summer study. Uh, so you can see all the information there beginning this Wednesday, June 1st. I cannot believe that this week begins June already. Uh, men, Saturday is the men's ministry breakfast. We would love to see you in the fellowship hall at 8 a.m. Uh, let me also now address a couple things for a matter of prayer. Uh, it's just a, it's a heavy morning, right? Memorial Day tomorrow and um, things happening in our nation, things happening in our denomination. Um, I, I do want us to pray in a moment for the families in Texas uh, who uh, are grieving uh, and and, and what, that, that word even sounds uh, too weak. They're aching, they're, they're grieving, they are uh, in misery, losing so many children from a school shooting, another school shooting. So I want us to pray for those people, for the churches in that area. I also want to mention, uh, ask you to be in prayer over the next few weeks. So in two weeks, the um, Southern Baptist Convention will meet for their annual meeting. Um, and uh, I want, to, want you to be in prayer. You may have heard, I don't expect everybody to have heard of this, but last year uh, the messengers voted that a, and a third party investigation would be done to produce a report that would show how things have been handled regarding claims of sexual abuse uh, among leaders and pastors and workers within our denomination. And that report came out last week. Uh, I read it this week, very thorough. Uh, a very challenging, difficult read in many ways, but I hope that we'll find it will be a very helpful resource moving forward. My, my request is that you would be praying that as the denomination, 
that our denominational leaders, our entity leaders, our pastors, our messengers, our people, our church people, that we would seek to continually find ways to better respond to people who have experienced abuse. And sadly, this report validates many claims that, uh, that can be shocking and, and very difficult and tragic. Uh, but the way that this hopefully will work is that the, the National Convention will be able to begin processing the report in June. Our state's convention meets in November. They're already, they've already had a task force assembled to begin to prepare to help South Carolina churches take the fruit of this report and learn ways we can be proactive, ways we can be better trained, better aware, just more helpful, safer places, things like that. And then as a church, we can take the fruit of all that work and apply it as well ourselves. So I just want you to be in prayer that, uh, that we will take the best steps moving forward for that. So let's pray for these things, and then we'll look at our passage. Lord, I do thank you. I thank you for the blessing of freedom. Lord, I I thank you that we experience enormous freedom here in this country. We know that freedom has been won for us by so many men and women sacrificing their lives over the years, year in, year out. Lord, I want to pray for families who, in recent days, recent years, have lost loved ones for this country. Lord, I pray that knowing that we enjoy a freedom here that transcends what most of the world experiences and enjoys. And I I ask by your grace we would not take these freedoms for granted. That we wouldn't presume upon them. I pray that it would actually fuel our worship in many ways, knowing that the ultimate freedom was also secured by the death of a loved one, the death of your son. Lord, I want to pray for families, the community in Texas who are grieving in raw emotion over another school shooting, lives of precious children being lost. Lord, we we do our best in this moment to grieve with those who grieve, to mourn with those who mourn. I pray for every mom, every dad, every sibling, every grandparent, that somehow they would experience the, the loving, compassionate, sympathetic touch of your presence. You know what it's like to lose your child. And I don't pray that lightly. I, I know there are angry questions understandably being thrown your way. And I'm glad that you, you are sovereign to handle them. I do pray, Lord, for the churches in that area. I pray for your people that they would be able to minister well. Those, some of those may be the ones mourning directly the loss of their children, I pray, Lord, that they, there would be a clear gospel reflection of hope. Lord, I want to pray for our denomination that we would do things well in the next couple weeks, that we would think well on the reality of how things have been handled over the last couple decades for victims of sexual abuse, how things have been handled when we look at those who committed that abuse, the abusers, Lord, I pray that we would be honest, that we would be objective, that we would have the right emotions, that we would be personally invested in it as churches and state conventions and people. And Lord, I pray that the right steps will be taken moving forward. So give, give wisdom where it is needed. And I pray at our church as we anticipate finding ways here in this local congregation to learn, to benefit from the results of this investigation report, that we would take those steps well in days to come. And Lord, now I pray, in the context of all that heaviness, 
I pray that we will worship you over your word. That we will hear from you. From a passage that was a heavy moment, a moment of mourning and grief. It itself is a memorial moment. Grieving the loss of a loved one. May we worship you through this. May we see how you want to speak in very intricate and intimate ways to each one of us and to us collectively as a congregation. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. As I said, our text is Genesis 50, verses 2 through 14. Let me remind you that Jacob also known as Israel, passed away last week in our text. And we will see what happens in the immediate aftermath of his passing. Let me go ahead and give you a heads up. I'm going to point your attention to four things. I'm going to tell you what the first three are. I want you to observe a required preservation. Then I want you to hear a requested permission And then I want you to marvel at a royal procession. And then the fourth, I'm going to keep close to the vest. And I'll tell you that in a few moments. Make sure you still pay attention. First, I want you to observe a required preservation in verse 2 and 3. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. So I'm wanting you to observe a required preservation. The reason I put it that way is because Joseph, as we will see in a moment, has committed to taking his father's body back to Canaan. It would need to be preserved to make that trek. This is a required preservation. So he has Egyptian connections, as convenient as this would be, to embalm his father to preserve his father's remains. It is a required preservation for the trip to fulfill the promise that he had given his father Israel. And yet I do think that we can speculate some symbolism in here that I just want to propose At least it's ironic that Israel died like an Egyptian. Just ponder that. And then think about it. It doesn't seem right in a sense. And I think maybe that's part of the point of this text. We're going to observe multiple things that from one angle just don't seem right. I think that's helpful. Do you have things in your life that just don't seem right, that don't feel right? When you look at it, when you observe it, you know, this is just not how it should be in one sense. I I want the, the text of Scripture to tap into that emotion of yours today, however it may do so. So we've observed this required preservation. Now I want you to hear in verses 4 through 6 a requested permission When the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up. And bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph, interestingly enough, doesn't go directly to Pharaoh as we might assume he would. We know that he has great connection to Pharaoh. I would say most likely this is to go about this request in the most effective, maybe we could even say strategic way. Make sure that he's given freedom to leave You can imagine in many ways Pharaoh might not like the idea of him leaving and hopefully never coming back. He gives his word that he will return, so he requests permission. I want you to think about this thought. Some more irony kind of implied in here. 
Joseph is seeking permission from Pharaoh to fulfill a promise to Israel. It's very important. All morning we remember that Jacob's other name was Israel. As the text showed us, Israel. I want you to hear that in all that we know Israel becomes throughout the canon of Scripture. Isn't it ironic that Joseph would need permission from Pharaoh to fulfill a promise to Israel? Now, I also want to draw your attention to something said in verse 5. It just struck me in a way that I wanted to take a moment, kind of bring it out and put it right here before our eyes. Look at what Jacob had told Joseph. He says, I'm about to die. Now take this thought in. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there shall you bury me. That is a profound thought. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself. I started wondering the benefits of digging your own grave. Now we use that, well, he dug his own grave there. That's never a good thing. Never a good thing. And yet, think about the benefits of having to dig your own grave. I mean, I just pondered the, I don't know how long it would take me to dig my own grave. And let's say we're going six feet deep. It would take presumably hours to dig my own grave. But think about it. If I did, imagine all of the profound, sobering reflection that would take place. Digging my own grave of hewing out my own tomb, thinking about the fact that one day I will die. One day I will return to the ground from which we were created. It's a profound thought. The closest thing that I can really get to anticipating that thought is when I read through the guidelines, the bylaws of the Chapin Baptist Church Cemetery Committee. Believe it or not, we have guidelines. I was given those. Woody Wager Sr. does a fantastic job overseeing that. And when I landed here very soon after, I received this document and read it and listened to what I learned. Grave sites shall be made available for the burial of any senior pastor of the church without charge. That's one of the perks of the job, folks. Sort of a sobering thought when we take a funeral procession back there to the cemetery, wondering, is this likely the place that I will be buried? It is an intriguing thought. It reminds me to appreciate life. Digging your own grave would at least remind you to appreciate life and mainly to appreciate the temporary status of this brief Life, the Bible refers to our life as a vapor. It also reminds us to anticipate eternity. Dig your own grave and tell me you don't wonder what happens next. Now there is this clause in the bylaws that says to the extent that unallocated grave sites are available. I wonder if I'm in my 60s, if y'all still have me around, we start doing more burials back there. I'm just like, wait a second now, hold on. How many more of these we have? We got enough space for me. I want you to appreciate everything out of life, but I really want you to appreciate how short it is. But anticipate eternity. Now, let's marvel at a royal procession. Verse 7, so Joseph went up to bury his father. Now watch this. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh. Now, maybe this should, shouldn't go without saying, remember, Pharaoh is the king. He ruled this empire, the Egyptian empire. All the servants of the king are going up with Joseph and it's not done there. The elders of his household, Pharaoh's elders go. It's not done there. All the elders of the land of Egypt. Take that in. The servants of Pharaoh, the elders of Pharaoh. As a matter of fact, all the elders of the land of Egypt 
as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. Now that, that does give us a little hint of things to come. When chariots and horsemen are going to be chasing the Israelites who are fleeing Egypt. But for now, we are to marvel at this royal procession. We're told at the end of verse 9, it was a very great company. So think about this now. Not only did Israel die like an Egyptian, if you step back and observe this procession, Israel died like an Egyptian king. We took one layer of profound irony and added another one to it. Let me just tell you, I won't even be able to mention all the layers of irony in this text. That's how thick and rich God's word can be. Israel died like an Egyptian king. Now let's consider even more richness here. Let's first consider a very peculiar lament before burial. I want you to consider a peculiar lament before burial. Verse 10. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim, it is beyond the Jordan. You may have a footnote that explains Abel Mizraim means mourning of Egypt. Now this is a peculiar lament before burial. Let me point out why. Several layers here. First off, they are mourning at a threshing floor. Now I realize when I mention that you may be like, so... If you were here when we went through the book of Ruth, one of the things we learned is that the threshing floor became a symbol of harvest. When the farmers went to the threshing floor, it was a time of celebration. So much so that they often got out of hand, which is why when Ruth went to Boaz in the middle of the night at the threshing floor, that was very scandalous appearing. Here we see them stopping to mourn at a place that was a symbol of celebration and hope and harvest. More irony. On top of that, the name of the threshing floor is Atad, which means bramble or thorn. So this is a threshing floor of brambles, a a threshing floor of thorns. What kind of harvest can you get out of brambles? What kind of harvest can you get out of thorns? There's not much hope. This is just my take on it. There doesn't sound like much hope in the name of this threshing floor. So they have this grievous lamentation there. Let me add another layer. The Canaanites... The Canaanites, who are the people of the land, they're observing this. Now, most likely threshing floors would have been elevated to take full advantage of wind. So they can see, maybe from a distance, this lamentation. And what do they see? They see Egyptians mourning. So if I kind of culminate the irony here, Canaanites watch what they perceive to be Egyptians mourning their king. But we know that Canaanites are watching Egyptians and Israelites mourn Israel. It is a peculiar lament before burial. And in just a moment, I'm going to tell you what I think we need to glean from it. Before that, let me also point out a precise location for burial. All right, so we've noticed a peculiar lament before burial. Now we're going to be notified of a precise location. Location for burial. Look at verse 12. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. I believe that's the third time this description occurs in Genesis. I joked with the staff this week. If I have to read the description of this burial place one more time, 
It is so specific. It is in the land of Canaan, in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron, the Hittite, to possess his bearing place, which is exactly how it's described in last week's text, chapter 9, verse 30 and following. A precise location for burial. Now, I want us to take two, two thoughts here. First, I want you to learn the lessons of the peculiar lament before burial. Learn the lessons. Here's what it is, and I want to explain how I landed there. God is planting his seed of salvation with hints of his harvest. That's what I think is going on here from God's perspective. Yes, Joseph has brought Jacob's body to bury him, to fulfill a promise. Yes, they are accompanied by so many Egyptians. Yes, the Canaanites are watching. But from God's perspective, I believe he is planting his seed of salvation with hints of his harvest. Here's why I say that. If we think they are at a threshing floor, we acknowledge the irony. They're mourning at a threshing floor. What are they on their way to do? They're going to a very specific location. Why? To bury a loved one. To do what? To plant a seed in the ground. Going in reverse order from the harvest. God wants us to look at things and say, these things don't look right. This doesn't make sense. And we can say, but God's doing something through this. He's saying, watch what I'm doing. I'm taking my people back through all of this, back through this odd experience at a threshing floor where we would celebrate the harvest, we're going in reverse order and we're burying a body just like planting a seed. And you may say, well, Mike, you're off your rocker a little bit. Well, you may have said that before I even got up here for all I know. But listen to Jesus in John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In other words, do you want to see a harvest? Then you have to bury a seed. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 36. The Apostle Paul says, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. I want you to learn the lessons of this peculiar lament before burial. I want you to take all of life that doesn't seem to make sense, that seems like it's going in the wrong direction, that you can't make sense of it, it just doesn't feel right. And I want you to take joy in the fact that God is planting His seed of salvation with hints of His harvest. And if you want that harvest then you have to experience death. Now ponder the point of the precise location. Why are we again reminded of this precise location? Here's why. God gives his people certainty for eternity. Again, we get this emphatic description of the burial place, the original location of property that God's people owned in the promised land. With precision, with emphasis, repeated for the third time, I believe, this is where you will bury him. God is giving us a hope, a promise of certainty for eternity. That's what's happening here. This is just Genesis. This is just the beginning. We can't expect things to be fully resolved here at the very beginning. But we got hints of things to come. Now let me show you why I can say that. I want you... Turn back to chapter 12, then I'm going to invite you, if you feel inclined, to go with me to Galatians. Genesis 12, verse 7, this is the chapter where God called Abram. Abram began following God. He promised a certain land. Genesis 12, I'm actually going to sneak up to part of verse 6 first. It says, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. 
Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So God's promised the land. That's where Jacob is being buried. Let me add a little more emphasis. Remember that word offspring? Do you remember what else it means? Seed. To your seed, I will give this land. Now, I'm going to go to Galatians. If you'd like to come with me, seems appropriate since we'll be going through Galatians soon. I'm going to Galatians chapter 3. I want to draw a connection here. In Galatians chapter 3, I want you to first look at verse 13 and 14. I'm going to point your attention to a couple more verses after that. Galatians 3 verse 13 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Let me just, before I keep reading, make sure we understand here, he's talking about the crucifixion. On the crucifixion, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We are, we are under a curse under the law because before God, we are like filthy rags. Before God, our sin deserves death. Christ redeemed us from that curse through the crucifixion. You say, well, why does that matter in light of our text? That's where verse 14 comes along. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham... In other words, the blessing of Genesis chapter 12. In other words, the blessing of the people of Israel might come to the Gentiles or to the nations so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Paul's telling us Christ died on the cross to redeem you and me so that we might receive the blessing that was given to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, where he promised all the peoples of the earth would be blessed, including us. But I want you to show there's even more. Go down to verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his, there's that word, offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. The hints of harvest in Genesis chapter 50, as always, are pointing us toward Christ. When they stop and mourn for seven days, a complete period of lamentation, At this threshing floor named Thorn. It's hinting at the hope that we only have in Christ. The offspring that was promised all the way back in Genesis 12. Let me give you one more verse. Look at verse 29. I'm going to read this verse and then I'm going to plead with you. And if you are Christ's. Then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So I want to plead with you, come to Christ. When you look at life, do things look off? Things don't feel right? When you're looking for celebration and hope for harvest, do you just see thorns and desolation, and grieving. Come to Christ. Why? Because he's going to make it all easier? No. That's a false gospel. And you walk with me through Galatians, and we'll see what God thinks about false gospels. I'm not saying everything will look perfect immediately. No, not even close. Things could even get worse. Come to Christ. Why? Because only in Christ will you experience redemption, which is the idea of God taking the painful, broken mess of this world and buying it back through His Son and preserving it and restoring it, sustaining it for eternity. That's redemption. That's why we can look 
at Jacob being buried and the irony of all these Egyptian royalty and nobility and eldership surrounding him, knowing it's an irony here, and yet it's more true than they realized. Because the people of the nations will honor the offspring of Abraham, Jesus Christ. Come to Christ. But i got to give you a second plea. Count the cost. We do not flippantly tell people to come to Christ and make all these promises, try to make Him as appealing as possible. No, come to Christ, but count the cost. Now, the reason I say this from our text this morning is because of verse 14. The last verse in our text, Genesis 50, verse 14. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. We wrestled with this as a staff this week. How tempted would Joseph and his brothers have been to just stay in Canaan? Think about it. They went back home. Well, a few things are important. They left their children in Egypt. That would be a good security measure from Pharaoh's perspective that they would come back. They were also accompanied by chariots and horsemen, a military procession that, yes, would have protected them, but also would have made sure they came back. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to observe. I want you to acknowledge a return to oppression. So first, I wanted you to observe a required preservation. Then I wanted us to hear a requested permission. Then we have marveled at a royal procession. Now we have to acknowledge, whether we like it or not, a return to oppression. Joseph and those who went with him, they went back to Egypt. To oppression? Well, the answer ultimately is yes. I imagine almost everyone in here already knows what will one day happen to the Israelites in Egypt. Let me remind you, it's already been promised in Genesis that they would be held in slavery for 400 years. Our text only gives us hints of the harvest to come. There's a long way to go, which is instructive for us. Because the truth is, your seed is not done dying. You have to be buried too. Come to Christ, but count the cost. Jesus says, if any would want to come and follow me, they must pick up their cross daily and come after me. You have to die to self. But a seed must die. In order to produce a harvest. One of the things that we can take hope from in this text. Is just like Jacob. We can expect to die. Now Jesus may come back before that. But I'm willing to bet. I said this cautiously. I'm willing to bet we should prepare our mindset to die. The fact of the matter is we may like Jacob wither in the land of affliction. But in Christ, we will be planted in his land of promise. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Before I pray, I want to encourage you. Think about how life doesn't feel right. Think of the circumstances. Life seems wrong and ask God to show you in those points let him show you how there is a hint of the harvest to come God I thank you that we can look at Israel dying in Egypt Buried with the the honor of a royal procession. And know that there's so much more to come. God, I want to pray for my friends in here who are struggling. They're mourning someone. 
or they're just grieving over the pain of life. Or they're wondering why things don't seem to make sense. Things aren't going as we had hoped, going as we would draw them up. I pray, Lord, that even now in this moment, you would draw them closer to you so that they can even better trust how you are still in the business of planting seeds of salvation, giving us just hints of the harvest to come. Lord, I certainly pray for those who need to come to Christ. I pray that they would count the cost. That you called them to follow you and give total allegiance to you, to die to their very selves so that they could follow the one who died for them. We pray this in his name. Amen. Church, would you stand as we sing together, respond to God's word. have received the words for your benediction from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning of verse 23. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. Amen. And have a great Memorial Day.